to now um, introduce our presenter, who is going to talk about the culture, how to build the culture, and your brand of your nonprofit organization. Melanie Sadak is the president of Valley Maine Society located in Pleasanton. Melanie is an empathetic leader who values integrity and trust. She lives her life to make a difference for others. In addition to creating a values-based culture at Value Maine Society, um, one that strives to embrace empathy, integrity, and collaboration, Melanie strives to impact the greater San Francisco Bay Area and beyond. She currently serves as a board president for the California Animal Welfare Association, and she also shares the, chairs their legislative committee. Both roles allow Melanie to influence life-saving initiatives throughout the state of California and beyond. Before joining Valley Maine, uh, Valley, uh, Melanie managed the, the Traffic Safety Department for the California State Automotive Association, where she worked to support legislative and educational programs that improve highway safety for children in and around motor vehicles. Melanie has worked for nonprofit and for-profit organizations. She has 23 years in corporate and small business management areas. Melanie is passionate about Melanie is passionate about branding, public relations, and safety. Her determination to make a difference has led Melanie to be involved in a number of community organizations. In 2016, Melanie was named Tri Valley uh, Hero. She received the Tri Valley Hero Award for her community spirit. Please welcome Melanie. Uh, all right, hello everybody. Thank you so much for coming. I'm super excited to be here. As uh, Christine said, clearly I am passionate about branding, values, uh, the culture that we create, and I think that though this topic is important for all organizations, for-profit, non-profit, it's especially important for all of us that work in non-profit. We have a lot of volunteers, we've got staff members who maybe aren't getting competitive wages. I know at least at Valley Humane, somebody could easily go into the for-profit realm and make a lot more money than they'd be making if they're at Valley Humane. And so why we need to keep our people and keep them engaged. And so I want to tell you just really briefly about kind of what my world is. And so I'm in animal welfare. This presentation is going to have animals in it. That's just for your entertainment. Because this is, this is really about all of us. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of nonprofit you have. This presentation applies to you. Now in animal welfare specifically, we are... Um, we are charged with helping some of our most vulnerable kind of community members, right? We've got these little animals. We have to be able to instill enough trust that people know that we are going to take care of them. There are 200 animal welfare organizations in Alameda and Contra Costa County alone, uh, which is pretty crazy. So think about that from a nonprofit perspective where you're asking for donors to trust you. Now, I am not somebody who believes in competition. I will not put others down to elevate myself. So we have to work to make sure that people trust us. And I know that if all those other groups went away, Valley Humane alone could not help all the animals that need help. So we have to be working together. But in my industry, we also have an enormous amount of criticism. And often the criticism is coming from our own industry. Rescue groups saying that shelters are killers. Um, you know, putting an enormous amount of pressure. And so for animal welfare specifically, we have to build this kind of force field of trust around the organization so that when people are throwing these things at us, um, that trust is strong enough that it makes them just say, hmm, maybe this isn't true because it sounds like it's outside of the character that that organization has developed. And I trust them enough to ask the question. And so I will not go into all the gruesome details, but about six years ago, I, um, we had transferred a dog in from Stockton. And a rescue group decided that we had an underground railroad of purebred dogs leaving Stockton, going into Pleasanton for the highest price, which in this case was $150. Um, that dog came in. It was incredibly obese. 
shut down. Uh, we took care of it for six weeks. It finally found a new home, and uh, the owner finally came forward after all that time and said they wanted their dog back. So anyway, long story short, uh, the national media, media decided this was the greatest thing they've ever seen, and so this story was on the Doctor's TV show, Inside Edition twice, Good Morning America, Daily Mail covered it, one TV station in Sacramento covered it, and um, Lori Rice, one of our board members is here at Valley Humane, knows how horrible this was for us, <laughs> and me personally. But the reason I'm telling you is that two weeks after it was all said and done, I was finally able to see the whole thing more clearly and realized we did not lose any donors. Not one of our local media outlets covered the story. None of our local community members were bashing us on social media. And so really, no matter what happened, we had a strong enough force field around us that the people that mattered the most to our organization did not believe anything they heard. And if they had questions, they felt comfortable calling us and asking us instead of just believing what was said. And so as nonprofits, we are open to a lot of criticism. People have to have faith in us to get money in order to give us their resources, whether it's money, volunteer time, whatever. And so that's really what this is about, is how do we create that force field so that people want to engage with us and that they build trust and, and relationships. So let's see if I can make this work. So why does culture matter? Um, has everyone, everyone's heard of the Great Resignation? Yeah, some of us experienced it a little. And so in 2021, Gallup did this um, survey, why the heck are people leaving? And what they found was actually kind of disturbing. Most people were, when they surveyed, most people responded to say that they were not engaged at work, not engaged at all. And when people left, it wasn't because they quit because they didn't like the industry, they didn't like their position, they weren't getting paid enough. They left because they didn't like their culture at work. They felt like they weren't being valued, they weren't being appreciated, and they didn't know how their talents were leading to ultimately the outcome that the organization was trying to achieve. So you can see in nonprofit, those are things that just knowing that is super valuable. So how are our people generating the return that actually leads to greater success? And so it also said that you would have to pay somebody 20% more for them to leave a manager or supervisor that they felt appreciated them and that they appreciated. And so we often think that money is such a big driving factor for people, but in reality, the evidence shows that it's not. It's about how people feel when they're at work or they're volunteering with, with us. So I am a big values-based leader. I believe in values. I think that values make our job a lot easier and they provide guiding principles for all of us in the work that we want to do. How many of you guys have values for your organization? So even if you don't have them, you have them. You just don't know that you have them. And so I really believe if you haven't done it yet, doing a values-based organization kind of uh, project is beneficial. Invite everybody in your organization, every volunteer, board member, staff, maybe even some of your biggest donors, and ask them, what do we value as an organization? And start to list the words, single words, that summarize kind of what you think is, is really your guiding principles at work. And then from there you can do dots, break it down, you usually don't want more than three to seven, uh, and then you want to define them, because I have been, I'm on the board for the California Animal Welfare Association, and they don't define the values. And so sometimes people will call us and say, well, you're not living your values. Well, the definition that they're applying to that word is so crazy <laughs> that it's like, well, wait, how do you think that applies? And so by providing the definitions, it provides a guideline for what that word actually means for your organization. And so like for Valley Humane, we don't collaborate with, um, with rescue groups that are pretty much elevating themselves by putting other people down. And, uh, and so, but one of our values is collaboration. And so it's like, well wait, if we're not collaborating, are we not living our values? Well, when you look at all the values and you assess that group, it's pretty clear that they're not actually living our values. And so we choose to not hitch our wagon or have them hitch their wagon to us. And so if you read this, 
One of our values is optimism. So Valley Humane is a warm, happy place, a feeling reflected by the well-being of the animals in our care. We believe visiting, volunteering, and working here should be a fun, positive experience, a vibe we carry out with us into the community. Our good spirits cultivate enthusiasm for our mission and keep us hopeful when things get challenging. And so with that optimism, that word is then also influencing everything about our external communication, our internal communication. We use this when we're hiring people. So I just listed integrity, collaboration, compassion, companionship, and gratitude. Those are all our values at Valley Humane. And so when you have your team get involved in this work, then they, that they're their values too. It's not just you saying what your values are. It's kind of like um, Elon Musk. He goes into Twitter, right? What does Elon Musk value? Money, innovation, success. I don't know that for sure. I'm assuming. <laughs> but his assumption is when he went in that everyone valued the same things as him. So he was like, hey, I'm here to save the day. You have to work twice as hard. You're not going to get more money. But guess what? We're going to be more successful. We're going to innovate. And people were like, uh-uh, I'm out. Because we can't assume that our team values the same things that we do. We have to make sure that we are collaborative in our, our values-based um, uh, exercise. So I just put this in so that you guys can see all the ways that it can influence. When we hire people at Valley Humane, we're asking strategic questions to make sure that our staff actually want, are gonna live our values. And so we'll ask questions. This is one of our favorite, and um, Claire is one of our newest employees, so she's gonna be like, oh, that was a plant question. But we'll ask, would you rather work with people or animals? It's a good question. So at Valley Humane, we believe in people. And so if you come in, you may think that we want to hear that you would rather work with animals because, duh, that's what we do. Um, not really recognizing that so much of what we do is really people-based. And so you, like all our volunteers, are humans. Uh, we have a lot of people engagement, so you have to be willing and excited to work with both. Uh, and so we really believe in people. Our internal and external communication is used by using our values. Um, even donor engagement is values-based. Our decision-making. Um, so I'm going to tell you one of my proudest moments. I've been at Valley Humane for 12 years, and it should not be one of my proudest moments, but it really is. And so one day, I come into work, and I look at someone's computer, and I see a woman's name. And I'm like, Ugh, why is that woman's name on your computer? And they said, oh, she's going to adopt so-and-so. And I was like, oh, I don't know about this. I know this woman, I used to own a store in downtown Pleasanton, she bounced checks up and downtown, she's got a reputation, I just don't know about this. And so then that was kind of it. And the next day I come into work and I go into one of the offices and like the entire team is in the office and I'm like, what are you guys doing in here? And they shut the door behind me and they said, we have to have a talk. I'm like, okay, we don't think you're living our values. I'm like, what? You're telling us that just because you don't think this person is a good person, that we shouldn't adopt to them. But you're always telling us that we should believe in people, that we should trust people. And even if they're not necessarily the best, like some people can be mean, that doesn't mean they won't be good animal owners. And I'm like, okay. And so in the end, we adopted to that lady. Everything's great as far as we know, she still has the dog. Um, but what an amazing moment for me to have my own team call me out for not living the values and creating a place where they felt comfortable doing so. And so I, I love it. And a lot of our decision making, one of our, our values is integrity. And so if we have to euthanize an animal, which is literally the hardest thing we have to do at Valley Humane, um, if it's medical related, it's pretty easy because we know the veterinarian is saying this animal is suffering. But if it's behavior related, it's very complicated and emotional. If we, sharing that information is very difficult with the public, sharing it with volunteers, very challenging. Um, if we feel like we have to lie about it, if we have to hide, then I wanna know if we have integrity in the decision that we're making. If we aren't making the right decision, 
then should we be making it? And if we are making the right decision, then we should be able to articulate why it's the best decision for the animal and stand by it. And so we use integrity a lot to make sure that we're actually making good choices and being transparent. So these, I'm just, we're not gonna go through all of these. These are just areas that you guys can influence. Um, so think about your customer service. How do people feel when they come into your organization? How do they feel when someone answers the phone? I always think it's funny, like how many of you have worked at a place where you have one crabby person? <laughs> There's always like that one crabby person. Everyone just puts up with them because they know so-and-so has been here forever and you know, she's usually crabby. In my experience, it's always been a woman. Sorry, but, um, and so that's not the person you want answering your phones. Because we want to make sure that people feel good about your organization. And so you might tolerate this crabby person, but the community doesn't know who they are. They're not going to tolerate them. So that maybe isn't the person that you want dealing with your customer service. How does it, this is going to be weird, but like, how do people feel when they walk into your organization? Does it smell weird? Is it dirty? Um, depending on what your role is in the community, you need to make sure that as soon as they walk through the door that they're experiencing what you want them to feel. So like at Valley Humane, we don't want it to smell. Oh, we don't want animals like screaming. That would be horrible, right? Uh, and so we're always trying to be aware of what is that experience like when people walk in. Communication, how are you talking about yourselves? Is it positive? Uh, what's your social media like? For Valley Humane Society, we actually have a pretty strict policy about social media, and not everyone can do it, but we don't allow people to be mean on our social media page. And so if somebody, we have to have a safe place. There's people that need to rehome their animals. So if somebody trusts us, and they put something on our Facebook that they need to rehome, and then we allow 50 people to tell them that they are horrible, rotten human beings because they have to rehome their pet then we no longer have a safe environment for that person to be able to do the right thing. And so then we get mad because people dump their animals. Well, why, it's so much easier to dump your animal than to be vulnerable and put something out in the open. So we actually, we will delete those comments and we have boilerplates that we put up. And guess what? Our social media is positive. If you wanna, I kinda say at work, if you wanna be a jerk, you can go to somebody else's social media page, but it's not our platform. We don't wanna engage in that. So we're holding everyone accountable to the values that we've set. Um, collaboration, who do you partner with? What's your community outreach look like? And then for me, one of the most important is staff and volunteer uh, relations. And so I have a mentor I love. I don't know how many of you guys know Jeff Hank. Um, he's pretty involved in nonprofit. But he will say, um, let people have their say. It doesn't mean they're going to get their way. And most people just want to be heard. And so having meetings where you bring volunteers in and just allow them to have a voice. It's amazing what kind of impact you can have in your organization just by allowing people to actually communicate openly with you, share their concerns. Um, what you don't want is for people to have mystery. Like as soon as there's an unknown, that's when rumors get started. That's when people start to make up their own reality. And so the more transparent, open, honest, the more we can provide a platform for people to communicate, the, the more successful you can be. Dog. <laughs> Probably, yes. um, and so all of the stuff we're talking about influences your brand. And most people are a little confused about what brand actually means. They think it's your, your logo or your website. And in fact, brand is all of it, 100%. Everything we do, our brand is how we make people feel. And so when you're watching TV, when you're watching, like, I mean, I always think about Liberty Mutual, and now they have those emo commercials, there's literally nothing fun about insurance. I used to work for an insurance company. Nothing fun. Um, but they want you to feel like they're fun. And so they do the emo. They've got, I mean, all these insurance companies have just decided that their brand needs to be associated with fun um, and, like, quick and easy. And so when you see their logo, they want you to then think about that commercial. And not necessarily the emo, but the emotions that you felt when you saw it. And so everything that we're doing is about evoking emotions. So this is one of my favorite quotes, Maya Angelou. I've learned that people will forget what you said, 
People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how to, how you made them feel. And so it is difficult, and this, I feel like this presentation by the end is so overwhelming because there's so many things you can influence. But if you just think about that one thing, that how am I making people feel, that can influence so much of what you do in your organization. So how do you want people to feel? What, is the, what do you want them to think about this? Like, how do you want your donors to feel about the work you do? How do you want your clients to feel? Uh, you know, Christine and I were talking, when the clients come into her organization, they can't feel judged. They need to feel warmth and empathy and know that they're in a safe place with people that care about them. And so if you have an organization that's working with the unhoused, you probably don't want to send people out that are wearing suits <laughs> and like a bunch of jewelry and look polished because it's going to be intimidating and make people feel like maybe those aren't the people they should be trusting. And so we have to kind of think about what our actions are saying to the people around us. And so and most people are attracted to environments that make them feel good. They want to know that their donation is making a difference. They want to know that they're impacting something positive. Sometimes you'll see um, nonprofits, they get into this negative cycle where, you know, at least in my world, animals are dying every day, your money is needed, but animals are never living then. And so it's like at what point do you just get sick of giving money to, to never see what the positive outcome was? And so really letting people feel good. So why do people volunteer and donate to nonprofits? Like, what is it? Why do people want to volunteer and donate? Solve the problems. It makes them feel good. It makes them feel good. It they, want, they want to feel like good people. Yeah, I mean, all of everything everyone's saying is correct, but ultimately, it makes us feel good. Like, I, it fills my bucket to know that I made a difference. I can't, I mean, and so it's, it's so attractive and appealing, and so as soon as we take that feel good away, ugh. Why would I want to do this? You're not making me feel good. Um, and same thing where we can get a little obsessed with our strategy. And so if you have, it's easier for me to use Valley Humane because I don't want anyone to think I know enough about anyone's organization. And to think, oh, are you talking about my organization? No. So I'm just going to use the Valley Humane example. Let's just say we have five rooms full of puppies. And as cute as puppies are, they are dirty, dirty little animals. <laughs> right? They have no, they're dirty. Uh, and so it's an incredibly difficult volunteer job. Our organization, we have 500 volunteers, about 240 that do uh, volunteering in the facility. Puppies are the hardest to take care of. And, uh, and so let's just say we're about to open the facility and there's three rooms that still haven't been helped. So the team could easily go, what is wrong with you guys? Are you talking a lot? Why is it taking so long to do this? Come on, come on, we have to open. Or you could say, oh my gosh, you guys, I'm so sorry. I know it's really hard today. I'm going to take my heels off. I'm going to grab as many people as I can. Let's jump in and get this done and build them up. Both lead to the same outcome, but one is tearing people down versus building people up. And so the more we think about kind of how we're influencing that person and making them feel, the more we can have them stay. And so you have, when you focus on this stuff, we have uh, fewer employees leaving, fewer volunteers leaving. You can even think in your own organization about tapering. So like an entry level, we do this with fosters. If you want to be a foster, we're going to give you a super easy animal as your first foster experience. Because you're not embedded in the organization enough yet. And so we want you to feel the reward of having this super easy experience. And then as you move on, if you're open, we might give you more challenging animals. Uh, because the more embedded you are, the more you're willing to kind of um, push your comfort level a little bit. So we have things that are super amazing, super awesome, but we also have things that aren't super amazing and super awesome. And so the more that we can make people feel fulfilled, the more that they can engage in that uncomfortable stuff and, and still feel OK and want to, to stay with your organization. <coughs> So I'm a total nerd, and this is my favorite slide. Uh, has anyone heard of the Jahari window? This is, uh, so this is really used for professional development and, and really about people. I'm going to make this about an organization. And so trust is really our greatest asset that we have in an organization. And so with this window, your green box, the arena, 
is really what everyone knows, what you know about your organization and what everyone else knows about your organization. The bigger this box gets, the more trust you end up having. And so ultimately, you want people to know as much as they can possibly know about your organization. Very few secrets, very few unknowns. Your blind spot box, where it says feedback next to it, is things that you don't know about your organization, but other people do know. And the only way you're going to know is if you're willing to listen and get feedback. And so listening and getting feedback is super, super important. And sometimes it's hard to get feedback. It feels very personal. And I know that sometimes I can get defensive. And so I will say, I might not always like what you have to say to me, but it doesn't mean that I shouldn't hear it. And so I want to have a safe place where people can give me feedback and I can take it and not make them feel like they're going to be punished for giving it to me. And so the more that we can open up those blind spots, the more we can have open conversations with donors, with volunteers, with staff members, the more we learn about ourselves and the bigger that green window becomes. Then if you go to the bottom left, facade, these are things that maybe you know about your organization, maybe your staff knows about your organization, but you don't want the public to know. And so ask yourself, why don't I want the public to know this? Can we be more transparent? Can we be more open with our community? Why do we have things hidden? And so I'm always trying to think about this. I don't want to give anyone any kind of ammunition to feel like I'm hiding things from people. Now, of course, when you're dealing with employee matters, you cannot share all that detail. Uh, but the more that people feel that you're open and honest with them, the more that that green arena starts to open. And then our unknown self, that's really our potential. Once we, we start to grow the green box and our arena gets larger and larger, our potential as an organization starts to grow. Things that maybe we don't even know are options right now become options later. Because now our trust has grown, maybe our volunteer base, our financial base, everything is growing, so more people want to engage with us. And so ultimately, building trust and transparency is so key to engagement with our community. And I put this, um, the little, the building trust on the side, so I am a little bit of a nerd when it comes to government and trust. I'm actually a little fascinated with um, law enforcement. And how crazy is it that the group of people that we empower and trust to, um, to uphold laws in our country are also the very group that people feel shouldn't be trusted in some ways. And so what's fascinating for me is when a department excels in building trust. What did they do to make their community feel like they could trust them? And that should be what we strive for. And so most of your government entities are following these five things. They want to make sure that they're being transparent, that they're not hiding things, that they're not trying to somehow look like they could be caught doing something that's not appropriate. They are listening. So they're open to feedback, they're listening to what people say, and they're human. So you can listen all you want, but if you're listening and your arms are crossed and you're like not really listening, that's not being human. So people need to know that you care, they need to know that you understand what they're trying to say to you. And it doesn't mean you have to agree, but the more human we are, the more um, people can, can will build trust. So like with a police department, the more that they put information on social media about like an officer doing something amazing, or, uh, or even about the officer as a human being, the more that creates a connection because then it's not just this person over here, but somebody that they can connect with. Uh, and then competent, they can actually do their job and they're reliable, so you can trust the work that's being done. And so all of these things help build trust in our communities. So then, really, this is the last big piece for me, is, is your environment safe? So we need to make sure that it's safe to make mistakes. And I will tell people, like, do not lie to me. Like, that, to me, breaks down the trust, right? If you make a mistake, just tell me. I'm not going to punish you. We literally just had one of our managers accidentally told one of her team members um, that their pay increase would start on March 1st, but it doesn't start till April 1st. And so she's like, I'm really sorry. You know what, fine, 
Mistakes are made, right? Do I think that she tried to do that intentionally so she could get more money for her staff? Yes. No, she didn't. <laughs> uh, but that's okay. You know, mistakes are made. Is it going to put me off budget a little bit? Yes. But in the end, it's okay. We will figure it out. And so, you know, if we're open to people being allowed to make mistakes, then it actually just is a, it's a better environment for your organization. We had a, a veterinarian, not at Valley Humane, but um, I listened to a vet speak about how he builds trust in his vet practice. And uh, when an animal's coming out of anesthesia, they get a drug that reverses the anesthesia. And so the vet walks away, the um, RVT registered vet tech is reversing, but she tripled the reversal drug and the animal almost died. Now she could have easily not said a word to anyone. No one would have known why that animal died. But instead she said, I made a mistake. They rushed over, they saved the animal's life, and then because of that, they actually changed their process and their procedures. So the person drawing the drugs isn't the person administering them. They have a double check now. And so when we allow people to be human and make errors, then we can actually learn from them and prevent future mistakes. And so allowing people to, to be heard, um, no power struggles or retaliation, this can be a little challenging for some people, but you know, listen, if you're the boss, you're the boss. You don't have to prove it, and you don't have to go after people. I don't think anyone wins when that stuff happens. And so the more transparent and vulnerable we are, the more human we are, the more open we can be. Um, and, and lastly, try not to make excuses. So when I first, I had to do a project for Maddie's Fund, and I was overseeing all of the rescue groups in Alameda County. And some of the things I heard were was really interesting. And so one of them was, I can't figure out why that group keeps getting all the money when I'm the one doing all the real work. Well, when you make excuses like that, essentially you're saying, I don't have to try any harder than I'm trying now because they're going to win all the time and I'm going to lose. And so when we make excuses, we give ourselves a reason to just give up and not fight harder. And the reality is that group over there is doing a better job telling people what they do, and because of it, they're getting more resources than this group over here. Because this group is kicking butt, helping and helping and helping, but they're scraping by and they're prioritizing their, their mission over everything else. But you can't have a mission-based organization that does great work if you have no supporters. That's part of our bread and butter, so there has to be a balance. And so instead of looking at the other groups saying they, you know, they're taking all my money, they could look at themselves and say, what are we doing that would help you know, grow our organization? How do we look at what they're doing and model some of this behavior? So we don't have to, I think excuses just give us a reason to give up. All right, I'm not gonna read this to you, whether you like Margaret Thatcher or not, I love this, because I think we need to be our authentic selves. And the more authentic we are, think about who you are, what you're saying, uh, what messages you're putting out, because that ultimately is who we end up becoming. And so I think it's a powerful message. And you know what? I'm just gonna keep that up, because the next one is, well, I'll show you really quick, because this picture cracks me up. Doesn't that cat look so angry? <laughs> Why are you pushing me up against that dog? All right, I'll put that back. All right, that was it. So thank you guys so much. You can see um, I'm very passionate about this. I live it. I just want to tell you there is no such thing as perfection. You can't go in and say, oh, our culture is great today and walk away. Like everything we do is a living, breathing entity that we're constantly having. And, and Valley Humane slips. And then we'll have to have like a meeting and say, remember you guys, we have to live our values. You have to be willing to call people out. So if somebody says or does something that's not appropriate for your organization, pull them aside, bring them back to what's important. Uh, because it, it's work and it's constant, but it really is so beneficial. And you know what, I'm gonna say one last thing. It's super overwhelming, this whole kind of concept, but one little change can make a big difference. So when I was at, uh, on the board, I still am on the board for the California Animal Welfare Association, and so we, we have this listserv, this Google listserv. There's like 700 members. We had a few people that were on the board that were just putting some comments out there that were not really super supportive of other members. And, um, and so I really kind of fought, not in a leadership role. I was just a board member. I wasn't the president. I was just a member. And I just said, you know, if we're board members of a membership organization, we should be building everyone up. 
This should not be allowed. And so we made one change. Nobody on the board was allowed to put anything on the listserv that could somehow diminish another member. You would not believe the impact that one change had for the entire organization. The, we survey members every year. The amount of trust went up. The trust in the board went up. Um, the faith in, in um, you know, feeling comfortable putting information out there so people were more vulnerable. And so even the smallest little changes can have huge impacts. Uh, and so if you don't do this stuff now, but you want to experiment a little, just think about what that one little change might be to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. I forget the name of the graphic that you had with the four squares. Mm -hmm. If you could go back and that, you spent some time telling us about arena and facade, but not a blind spot and unknown self. So the blind spot mm -hmm. is um, the things that other people know about you, but you don't know about yourself. Mm -hmm. And so that's the area where you really want to be, um, you need people to, you need to provide a safe place for people to give you feedback and let you know. And so we can get a little obsessed with what we believe our organization is, but unless we're actually asking people and getting feedback and learning, um, we might not see it unless we ask for it. And then the unknown self was the opportunities that come forward. And so your unknown is what you don't know about your organization and what others don't know about your organization. And so this represents all of your potential. So what is it? So as your arena grows, then hopefully your unknown self actually starts to get a little bit smaller because now you've learned more about your organization, your potential grows, everything ends up um, becoming a little bit more apparent. So I've been with Valley Humane for 12 years. We just opened a surgery center like last week. Super excited, Yay. thank you. Uh, if you'd asked me 12 years if Valley Humane would have a second location, no way, no way. But as we've grown as an organization, as we've more transparent we've built our support that became something that was a possibility for us and so it was an unknown thing that became known and we were able to capitalize on it thank you you're welcome anyone else i have a question about doing the values development how long does that take what, what so kind, it can what kind of a process might that be it can take um, it can take a lot of time depending on how large your organization is and what you want to do and what process. And sometimes it's nice to have a consultant come in. But if you don't have that luxury, um, I personally like just inviting everyone. Not everyone will come, right? But they know they were invited. And then working through um, whiteboards and starting to just kind of lay out like what are these things that we believe in as an organization and really brainstorming, just throw every word up. And what you'll find is as you start to narrow down your list, words get put under other words. So like partnership might be one, and collaboration is one. Well, partnership and collaboration can actually be combined, so they don't need a separate word. Um, but yes, it depends on the size of the organization and what kind of, and oftentimes this happens with strategic planning. There's a lot of other things that go into it, but it doesn't have to be complicated. I would say the most important thing is that everyone feels included and that they've had a voice and that once you've picked those words, you define them and then you utilize them um, as guiding principles. You mentioned you had values. Do you have a code of conduct as well? We don't have a code of conduct. We don't. Have you needed one? No. Now, we use the values are the guiding principle for our employees. So even the employee reviews, we have the values and employees rate themselves based on our values. And usually employees are very critical of themselves because they're afraid you're going to be more critical, so they're more critical. And, um, and so it just gives them an opportunity to show, you know what, maybe I didn't have a lot of gratitude this year, or, you know, I could see this or that. And so then it's really just a discussion. And most of the time you might be saying, are you crazy? You don't think you have enough gratitude? Don't you remember you did blah, blah, blah? And, and really it can be a tool to then build them up to or talk about things that are struggling. And I use them, we've eliminated volunteers. 
because they're not living our values. We had um, two volunteers that were really talking very poorly about one of our employees because she was Japanese and they couldn't say her name. And when we found out, we addressed it immediately. Like, you don't want to delay. I'm big on candid and immediate because that person knows what they did. If you wait three months and you tell them what they did, they will never remember what they did. And one of the employee or one of the volunteers was so apologetic, she didn't even realize that she wasn't living the values and that she was diminishing this person. And the other one was pretty much like, I don't even like you. Why are you saying this to me? I can say whatever I want. It's like, you're right. You can say whatever you want, but not here. And, um, and so she was, she gracefully um, left the organization and, and decided that that wasn't a good fit for her. So, you know, there's still going to be people that ebb and flow. There's going to be people that leave your organization that aren't happy. Uh, but I really feel strongly that if you know the reason people are leaving is because it's just not a good fit, it's okay to let people go. It's okay to say goodbye. Any other questions? <coughs> Near the end, you're saying that you would serve one of the organizations that you would serve and people clearly. What type of questions were you asking? What type of information were you trying to follow up? So for Cal Animals, um, that's a membership organization, so we want to know um, do you feel that the organization is living the values would be one question. Um, are we meeting your membership needs? And so we're really crafting those questions so that we have a feel. Um, we, we survey our donors at Valley Humane. You know, do they feel like, because it gives us insight. Do they, some of our donors contribute because they really care about what we do for people, whereas other people really care about what we do for animals. And so um, we ask questions based on, on what we're hoping to learn. But I will say survey questions, it's so frustrating because you think you have the perfect question and you ask it and you get a horrible response where you're like, hey, that's not even what I wanted to know. <laughs> so ask other people to read your questions and start answering them without any feedback because no one's gonna stand there and listen to you give an explanation. And make sure that what you're asking is actually what you're looking for. Um, but yeah, let's you know make sure. Ask your like I did an interview with one of our volunteers, and I wish I could have just captured this moment. And um, and I just asked her, you know, how does it feel to be involved with Valley Humane? And she goes, Valley Humane to me is like is like an extension of my home, my family. I go in and I feel like you guys care about me, and I feel like I'm respected and appreciated. And it was like. Oh my gosh, like I want to carry her around as like a little addition to my business card. It was so meaningful to me. Um, but just as meaningful is a volunteer who thinks I'm euthanizing animals because they're disappearing and they don't understand. Well, that's good feedback. And so that did happen to me when I first started. And I'm like, holy cow, why do they think I'm in this organization? I'm not hurting animals. But it, what it told me was, oh, we need to be better communicating. Like, we need to tell people where the animals are going. So we created systems so that they knew that animals were actually getting adopted. Uh, and so listening to people is so, so valuable. Even if you don't agree with what they're saying, understanding where it's coming from can be very, very important. Yes? Uh, in regards to building a staff culture, can you talk about um, the balance of having your team, you know, do the job of the work with having fun as a staff, you know, there's sometimes a tension of like, you gotta do your job, but like, you know, this is still a family line or a community. So what, what's, what's your approach to that? <laughs> so I'm a, um, I, this is gonna, I'm an anti-family person. Uh, so I'm a team person. When you're in a family, somebody can be a slacker and you can't get rid of them, they're part of your family. Uh, but when you're on a team, everyone has a role to play and they have to actually live that um, expectation. And so uh, I think, you know, part of having, it depends on what your definition of having fun at work is. And so um, we still have to do the job that we have to do, but we can have fun with each other. And so for us, we have a very transparent environment. We have a very emotional environment when you think about what we do. And so we spend time laughing together. Our managers' meetings, sometimes it drives people crazy, but the first part of it is just being human, talking about what did you do this weekend, you know? Tell me this, tell me that, so that people can feel comfortable with each other. Um, I don't probably spend enough time doing team building. Like, we don't go bowling together. We don't go 
play trivia at McKay's. Um, and we could, but a lot of our volunteers <clears throat> and our staff go out and do those things together. Uh, and so I don't think one doesn't have to happen instead of the other. Um, so I think we can support each other, we can tease each other and be kind of human, um, but we're not necessarily partying at work while we're getting our job done. I don't know if that's helpful, but I feel like Chris has a fun work environment. <laughs> Thank you. Most of the time. Most of the time, yeah. So follow up on, on that. So I think board culture is one part of the culture of the organization staff synergy between the two is so important for the organization overall. What do you do to bring your board and your staff together so that there's um, like a continuity of values and branding and building of you know, engaged relationship? So again, those values are mo our most common denominator, right? So the board member has to, board members have to live the values, they have to be connected, and so do the staff. And so that is our bridge. And really, as executive directors, CEOs, presidents, we are the connector. Um, so I am maybe a little bit of a pain when it comes to the board. Lori can smile. Um, but my board doesn't have an overwhelming amount of engagement with our staff. Uh, and if they want to engage with the staff, they can volunteer. So some of them are volunteers. Lori works in our Animals program. But when they become volunteers, they're in a volunteer role doing their job. Uh, but what I found is when board members start to then engage directly with staff, that they can, they can derail processes. And so I want to be involved in those conversations so that I can intervene. Uh, but we do annually, the board and the um, staff get together, they communicate. We don't have a huge organization, so it's not unusual. People, the staff end up knowing who the board members are, but really it's the values that keep us connected. And I'm constantly working to ensure that the board values the work being done by the staff and understands it. So it's not hard to go off the rails a little bit in animal welfare. And so we, you, I'm constantly bringing people back to who we are, what we do, and what's important, and how that supports the team that we've got in place. 